I want you to read all your books. Have a sit-in. <laughs> you don't do your audio books there, do you? No, no, you no. You would be no, amazing. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. Uh, I so wouldn't. I'd leave it to the professionals. Come on, there's nothing worse than a, an, 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 a ham amateur actor. <laughs> the, 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 the I disagree. <laughs> um, Slate House. Um, yeah, we were talking and um, I'm trying to segue here gracefully. <laughs> I'm sure it's working. Graceful segue is overrated. Um, uh, yeah. I vote for sharp corners. But I thought this was such a great, perfect um, book for people who are just discovering David Mitchell's books. I don't know if you are Mitchellians or not, but... Um, <laughs> There's a few Wachowskiites here tonight, I would say, my friend. Uh, oh, just my mom. My <laughs> Oh, there's my mum and my dad in the corner too. It's been a long way. But um, the, what's, uh, it was, uh, even in the choice of the reading there, this, um, this, uh, these, this characteristic that I would say uh, of your books, which is, which is that uh, it starts with polyphonic, we talk about this with other people who may be here or not, but the idea of this polyphonic, polyphonic way of telling stories. So it's a ghost story and it starts off with these sort of rules that ghost stories have and and then it starts to break them and whereas most ghost, ghost stories are interested in one victim or one villain you know you start off and you want to have multiple victims you want to tell the story through a series of victims that are also interrelated and each one slightly developmental and each one slightly also assisting the other one which is also kind of interesting like the heroic quality or the hero of the story is actually in these tiny actions of the victims at the end of their lives, which is another Michelian idea, which we'll come back to. Make a note. Um, the, what I wanted to say is that here you have a characteristic of polyphonic storytelling plus this idea that there is a very natural world, a very sort of, let's say, our typical um, literary world of realism and naturalism and it's all details and it's things that are true and we recognize and we feel that we're in a, um, a, a classic almost sort of uh, literary approach to novel telling but then there's a wall there's a barrier and on the other side of that barrier there's this other world <laughs> that lots of strange things can happen and you know weird monsters can come after you and rules twist and it becomes more what we associate with genre storytelling. And this is like a classic David Mitchell thing where you have, you have these two worlds that everyone else wants to um, differentiate and everyone else wants to keep them separate and keep them on either side of this wall. Here's the literary world, here's all the books on the literary shelf. And over here, here's all the genre books, and these are all the supernatural and the science fiction, and here's this wall. And David Mitchell says, no, there's a little door. <laughs> and if you want, you don't have to have this or that. You can have this and that. Uh, for those of you who've never had your books uh, analyzed at a deeper level than you yourself understand them by, <laughs> by one of the uh, major creative masterminds of the film industry living today, I, I, I would suggest, really, don't envy me. Because, uh, because it, 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 it's, it's, it's uh, humbling, more than a little embarrassing, and so gratifying that, that, that I just want to melt into a puddle live on stage <laughs> i had a benign version of mr tolkien horn from the same house uh, uh, whenever lana talks about my work to me i i i'm just i first i was a thank you for noticing and caring uh and then what can you say when she's so undeniably right all the time. So, yeah, that's exactly what I do. I, I wasn't quite aware of it until you said it, but like, what can I say? Do you have the same problem, Sasha? It's just uh, really mortifying. 
Uh, but, so, we need to talk about high rail, low rail, middle rail, genre, uh, literary kind of fiction, and how I do not like these walls. Um, and to uh, paraphrase Roger Waters at the end of the wall, tear down the wall! Um, I don't like the snobbery of the literary side uh, that says um, genre fiction is for children and not worthy of proper adult attention. Not only is that elitist, which I dislike, it's also self-mutilating. Really? Do you really want no Master and Margarita in your life? Really want no Margaret Atwood? Really want no Midnight's Children? We, we, we all have our favourites, but, but, but what a bizarre policy. Um, nor do I like the inverted snobbery on the other side, um, where um, long-term genre denizens uh, do not like people from the, well, frankly do not like people who have ever had the word book a short list or long list and their name associated with the same sentence, coming in and playing with, with our toys, uh, with our tools, with our beloved tropes. Um, no, no, I can't be having with that. Uh, <laughs> They didn't do this in the 19th century. No one, um, no one took Dickens to task for having a ghost in his fiction in the same way that um, Kazuo Ishiguro was hauled over the coals for having a dragon in his book. Uh, if, if, if the book needs a dragon, it should have a dragon. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and, and I like the potential for cross fertilization um, I like uh, uh, my childhood book, bookshelf on it ha had The Dispossessed by Ursula Le Guin and The Left Hand of Darkness. And it had the robot stories by Isaac Asimov. It had Foundation, the Foundation trilogy by Asimov. It had Ray Bradbury. And it had Native, uh, Native Son by Richard Wright. And, the Grand Moan by Alan Fournier and um, other realist novels. And I don't see why maturity should involve a kind of genre-based apartheid. Uh, one over there, one on the other. Maybe that's a too flippant word, uh, use of a word with such, uh, such, historic, such historical sobriety, but it's still kind of how it feels. Well, I think that what I, what I love so much about it and what inspires me about it is that what you do is it takes a kind of courage because the, the, the market is so good at labeling. The market wants so much to say this is this for this audience and this is this for this audience and it's all sort of tooled and it's all, um, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's designed to deliver these expected packages and you keep, you know, throwing monkey wrench after monkey wrench into those, those that, that um, tool system, or that, that indus industry machine, and putting, and I hear sometimes even, you know, people are like, what, what, do, we, what do we do with this book? I don't know where to put this book. And, and that I feel is it's so inspiring to me, and it makes me feel happy when the people don't know where to put books. <laughs> <laughs> Because Actually, I've I seen your study, I know what you mean. <laughs> but it's, um, you know, I don't mind people who want to write this one thing, or the, and I think that's great too, and I have all those books on my shelves, but the, mine too is, is full of a wide, disparate range of, of authors, and I, I'm a, what I think is, it's great when authors will also write in a way that reflects a very diverse bookshelf. And that, as a book reading, you know, fan, I like when authors take risks of combining in a way that is, or recombining in a way that hasn't been done or is unique feeling. And that's what that's what keeps happening with your books. You keep looking to a kind of undiscoveredness in the recombining of both. Um, let's say, more highbrow taste and lowbrow taste. I mean, that the Bone Clocks had this like crazy psychic battle was, I, I was giddy over it in a way. 
Lana Wachowski was video for one of our team. We'll get it on. Let's finish uh, later. Yeah, uh, thank you. It, it's um.